Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So I'm back in uh, back in the office. So I was able to put together a uh, an econ show. I try not to replicate some of the stuff we talked about on the uh, FSC shows because I was able to put some decent econ data within that. So I just want to essentially essentially build on some of the things that we've talked about and some of the themes that have been coming to light. So we did a special update talking about Nord Stream, uh, the Ukrainian vote. What does that mean? And then in this segment, we're gonna go deeper into what is happening with rates. Obviously the UK is a huge piece to it. So we're gonna start in segment one, looking at global liquidity and how that stress continues to happen. Then we're gonna move over to US rates heading higher and how the Fed continues to push that. And how is what's happening within the U.S. economy because of it? Then we're going to look at housing pressure, which is only increasing. And we want to talk about some of the shifts in the data sets and why some of the there was a, a positive piece on new home sales, but there's some change in that that we want to highlight. And then in Europe, we're going to talk about the most recent inflation updates, which were absolutely horrific. And what does that mean for some of the uh, obviously confidence? And then we're in the when the last segment, we're going to talk about China and how the economy continues to get hit harder. But we also want to talk about how they're not immune to the dollar strength. And what does that mean for their economy? And how is that going to continue to be a problem? So just to kick it off, we wanted to look at trade because there's this is, I think, more important for what's to come versus where trade is right now, because during based on some of the data, trade has been actually rising in some areas. But we wanted to look at this first. So when you look at the Fredo's Baltic, uh, the freight uh, Baltic daily index, China to North America East, you can see that there's continuing to be a move lower. So China to East Coast, which is the blue versus China to West Coast container spot rates are falling. And it's they're falling because there isn't as much of volume going from point A to point B. Because the U.S., and we're going to talk about it in the second segment, there's a lot of inventory in the U.S. And there's, there is a limited need to spend these kind of the, the rates that they were. So we do see more pressure coming through. And then there's the tender rejections. So tender rejections, which measure the percent of contracted truckloads that are rejected, continue to make new cycle lows. As we head into peak season, there is no sign of recovery in the truckload market. Now, the peak season, it starts in September, carries us through November because we have Christmas. We have a lot of holidays coming through where a lot of people spend. So the fact that we aren't seeing rejections because we aren't seeing this, it means that truckers are truck companies, truckers in general are taking whatever work they can because we see this big disc, uh, disconnect and drop in the amount of product coming to the U.S. Why does that matter? Now, that matters because we are the largest buyers in the world. So if the U.S. isn't buying, Europe isn't buying, who is your buyer, which is why we continue to get this drop down in terms of available uh, uh, trade, how is the developed market? And as we've been saying, the developed market leads the emerging market, but how long does it take to go from developed to emerging market pain? And we think that this is really showing that the stress is, is really increasing now, and we're going to see a significant hit even further to the emerging market side when we're looking at both uh, debt and equity. Now, when we start turning to the other issues that are happening at the emerging market level, it's obviously the inflation. So the inflation side has slowed in terms of the inflation surprise index, but it's still elevated. And the reason why the surprise index has slowed is just because the policy rate has gone up so high, holistically speaking, look at all emerging markets. And that's obviously creating more stress on the system locally, but helping to essentially slow inflation and it's not stopping it it's not a it's not sending it lower it's just pausing the rise where it's rising but not at the same rate and it's interesting cuz you know president biden made a comment about about our inflation and, and how it was how it was slowing and it's important because I thought somebody created a, a, a very good analogy, and this is going to matter more and more as base effects start to come in, and they can show that you know inflation has slowed. But if if you're going 120 miles an hour, 
and you slow by one mile per hour, you're still going 119 miles per hour. You know, you haven't gone down and you're moving negative. You're still moving at an accelerated rate, which is why emerging market policy isn't going to shift. And as it doesn't shift and as the dollar stress continues, that's going to put more pressure because dollar availability goes down as liquidity shrinks. We'll talk about that more in the next segment. And you continue to see the dollar sitting at about over 112. We do believe the dollar goes up to about 115 and then onwards to higher to about 120. And the reason why is when you start looking at what is happening at the Federal Reserve. So liabilities and capital, when you look at draining reserve balances, reserve balances with Federal Reserve banks have moved negative. And again, they're trying to pull this through. They're trying to increase the, uh, again, quantitative tightening, which is going to pull dollars from the system, excuse me, while emerging markets need more dollars to, again, purchase and replenish their FX reserves. And this is why as trade slows and that natural movement of dollars going from the US to other nations, because remember, largest buyer. So if we're not buying these pieces and giving countries dollars, they have to go out and purchase them you know, in the open market or what will happen is through swap lines to try to protect the price of, uh, of um uh, the dollar. Now, when you look at other pressure points, we just we we've been talking about food. The data continues to show just how painful food is at this point. And one of the key pieces is when you look at China. So, world faces the worst food shock in more than a decade, according to the IMF. Food insecurity to worsen despite recent drop in prices. The 48 most affected nations need 50 billion dollars for 2022 just to buy food. The world is now facing the worst uh, food crisis, at, uh, at least as serious as the one experienced more than a decade ago. Uh, even though food prices have fallen, food insecurity is likely to worsen because of multiple factors, including supply bottlenecks, Ukraine crop, and high, and high prices of fertilizers and energy. The food crisis is at least equal to that seen in 07 and 08, which spurred severe food shortages and deaths, as well as social and political unrest. That is not surprising to anyone that has been watching our shows. It's why from the private equity perspective on C6, we've invested in Soltech, we've invested in other areas, honed in on supply chain as well as ag. The severe drought in China. So July 1st, the National Meteorological Center has issued drought warnings for more than 40 days. Tuesday marked its 34th consecutive day of drought warnings. The drought spans at least 13 provinces and regions, including key grain-producing provinces, Anu, Henan, Jinje, and Hunan. But the grain harvest is going well so far, based on the rural experts, with roughly 20% of the fall harvest completed in the Yangtze River region. The drought impact appears is limited. Again, what they say and then what the actual numbers will be, I think are going to be vastly different. The U.S. Department of Agriculture most recent satellite database forecasts also indicate the drought won't hit the fall harvest too hard. So that is a positive when you look at just where things are. But as you go forward and without the re the, repl the replenishment of the Yangtze River, because we're coming into the dry period, what does that mean for the next planting season? So will a drought break in time for the fall and winter planting? That's when key crops like rapeseed and winter wheat are planted. And based on the early data, it's unlikely that will happen. But what, they're, what Beijing is trying to do is issue massive relief packages to farmers in the region. But if the, if the drought doesn't break in the next month or two, there's no amount of can, cash that can bail them out for next spring harvest because not only are the farmers going to get hit, but you're going to see prices go up again. And again, China needs a lot of protection. They need a lot of food. And that is something that they are trying to, uh, uh, to address. Now, when we start turning to other areas that are becoming, that are a problem, you look at the gas and the electricity weights in the CPI baskets. So when you look at Germany, France, Italy, Japan, UK, US, you can see just how high the CPI baskets weight. And in the US, it's important to look at electricity because electricity is just really starting to get going and we're not even into winter yet. So this is when you look at the CPI baskets and why we've been talking about how 
we're not going to be see dis- deflation right away. This is going to be that's going to be a 2023 discussion. We still have inflation here. It will give way to stump stack stagflation, but electricity prices, diesel prices, heating oil prices going into the winter is going to take away any benefits that we've seen from gasoline prices coming down. But then when you look at natural gas in some of the key areas within Germany, France, and Italy, the pain is only increasing. So a recession tightening in financial conditions. So when we look at the U.S. and you look at just where the financial condition index sits, and if you invert it, you can see there is still much more damage to go on the real GDP side, which is why we are firmly in the view that Q3 is already in a recession, and it's something that is only going to get progressively worse as we move into 2023. Now, again, carrying through that view, the global recession, when you look at new export orders, are tumbling everywhere. They're back to their 2019 lows in Germany when Germany's manufacturing sector was in a recession. But this isn't just about Germany. As you can see, weak export orders mean demand is weakening on a global scale. U.S., Japan, France, U.K., Germany, key areas, especially when you look at Japan and Germany, which are pivotal uh, points that enter the international market that are very good bellwethers of where things are going. And the UK, based on everything that is happening with the with the guilt, with the uh, with the British pound, the pressure is only mounting as they can't export and again, bring in some of those excess dollars, the excess FX reserves, which is causing a lot of these underlying problems. And as you can see, it's in contraction, which as they're buying less, as they're exporting less, it just shows that, again, that reverberation down to the emerging markets. Now, global trade, uh, according to this, hit a new record in July as tracked by the Netherlands. Uh, But again, this is July. And so we had some of that peak. We had some of that catch up. And now, based on everything we've seen, everything we've been talking about, we believe that it is firmly negative and now back to where it was, uh, essentially, by the, by the time we got to 2020. So again, more downside, but it's still, it's, there's still some of that pressure, which is yet to show up in some of the data, which is why we do think there's more of that pressure to the downside. And here's just another example. So South Korea Semiconductor Exports Index, as you can see, it's below where it was in 2020. Global semi sales more downside ahead when you look at global semiconductor sales in U.S. dollars. But it's going to hit other economies, especially in Asia, when you look at Taiwan, when you look at South Korea, Japan, and China, because they are an assembly uh, line. When you look at what Apple has talked about, struggling with their new phone sales. This is just showing, again, we overbuilt. This is the last kind of piece of that bull whip. When you look at there is overordering, overpurchasing, and now you're going to have a lot of inventory sitting on the, on the market, and this will help pull down and create a little bit of that deflationary pressure on some of the electronics and the equipment that people need to buy, or at least you know, <laughs> when you look at buying a new computer, it might be a good time to do it soon. And then here's just showing the overhang in some key areas, obviously in Taiwan, excess inventory, Korea, inventory overhang. And you can see just how high it is in relation to where we were in 2012, 2013, 2014. And and uh, now if if it's an overhang here, it's going to hit local companies, again, local economies, because you're not moving product, which means that you will see that uh, impact. Now, when you look at FX volatility index, it's moving back up. And you know, if when we show you the move index, it has actually taken out the 2020 high. We believe that volatility on the FX side is only going to get worse. The UK is just a pre, pre, prerequisite of what's to come. And I think you're going to continue to see more and more pressure on that backdrop. Central banks keep trying to out hawk each other. And I think that's something that is going to continue to happen. And we'll talk about that more in a minute when you look at some of the activities that the Fed has done and what the BOE has done. And just to touch on the BOE, because we have that chart here, they stepped in because they saw pension funds becoming insolvent. So they stepped in and they bought some long dated debt. And I I believe it was $84 billion worth. But again, it, it, it was small. They got in, got out. The, they didn't have the ability, and the, the central banks no longer have the ability 
to do QE and stay there. They're just going to come in, do what they can, and then come out because the BOE said we still have to reduce our balance sheet. And that's the problem. There's no staying power now, and the market knows that. So if you step in, the market's just going to push, put pressure on you and bet where you know you're going to walk away, and that's going to send another move down, which is why rates and everything else is going to continue to be a problem. World central bank assets liabilities year on year, again, showing the tightening. It's a negative 2.08 trillion because we are firmly in QT. And as that continues, that's going to, again, put pressure on liquidity. You're seeing the liquidity pick get pulled out. And that's creating these pockets, which because it was such a uniform attack on just blasting liquidity into the market across QE infinity, this is now where we sit. These are the pressure points we now sit in. And that is going to keep pressure on that risk appetite. And you can see that typically, you know, you want to buy in those different points. We just see that, uh, again, there's more and more pressure that's going to keep us depressed and under pressure. So that's what we have for you on the liquidity side. In the next segment, we're going to go deeper into what is happening in the U.S. and how is all of this kind of culminating to what the Fed is trying to accomplish. <laughs> 